All right, here we are. Skeleton hairdresser, walnut worship. Only six stitches and other forms of restoration, including endless mud pit, um, <laughs> which was mentioned earlier, but was cut from the title. So um, anyhow, um, I'm Kathleen um, and uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Fraternal Forest before we get started and where we came from and our origins. We started out with, um, as an extension of Teresa Weed's project, the Forest Play School, which met at um, Walking Stick Woods at the North Park Village Nature Center um, and ran for several years. We, um, Soul is the parent of two kids who once they, they attended that program and once they aged out, she still wanted to be in the woods. So um, we were able to set up a play-based program for older kids, which um, is something that really attracted me to the program because I've been working with older kids, um, like grade school kids um, for most of my career as an educator. And I hadn't seen a lot of programs like this where um, the learning was directed by um, these kids who are usually in school or, or structured programs. And it was very unstructured in an environment that was at the time pretty heavily invaded with buckthorn, um, box elder. And we were able to let the kids kind of have low consequence, high touch, high impact um, forest bathing experiences where a lot of them would leave the forest with um, the lots of the actual materials that were in Walking Stick Woods on them. Um, and as the program evolved, um, we left the this environment and we are now in a new location. Um, we're in Schiller Woods. Um, and before I talk about that, I wanted to let Sol and Janie introduce themselves. And um, I'll just say I have a six week old baby that might make an appearance in this presentation. So um, her name is Cecilia. I'm a new mom. Uh, my life has changed very dramatically over the course of this last year, as I'm sure that lots of people have. And part of that was running the Fraternal Forest Program in the Forest Preserves of Cook County, to whom we are very grateful for the, um, for the permit and the support that we got from them. So Sol and Janie, I'll let you guys talk. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the, we're the arch of this conversation today is gonna start first, one of us is going to describe what we are understanding as play is. And then Janie is going to tell us how uh, play and play work can be used for, for social justice and, 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 and the, under the, uh, native people's um, life of of um, being in nature, and then Kathleen is going to talk about uh, about uh, play playing as adults, like how do we play as adults? And um, Jenny, you wanted to introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Jenny Pochel. Um, I'm First Nations, uh, Soto, which is OG Cree, which is a mix of Ojibwe and Cree. Uh, my dad's a citizen of the key band of Ojibwe Indians. Um, his father's band is the West Pacific band um, of the Cree people. My mom was Lakota and Irish. Um, I grew up in Chicago. I'm the co-founder of Shy Nation Youth Council and the founder of the First Nations Garden. Tri Nations is a, it's an intertribal youth collective, a grassroots collective. Um, we have a focus on social justice, environmental justice, and um, creating safe spaces for native youth through things like arts, activism, and education. Uh, the First Nations Garden was created as like a living library of indigenous knowledge and indig indigenous knowledge keepers. Um, it's a place for people in Albany Park and the people of Chicago to come and it's a community garden. So we have like regular community garden things, but also 
we built a wigwam, which was the first wigwam um, built in Albany Park in uh, over 100 years. Um, we have a teepee over there. Uh, we use the space, we have a sweat lodge, we use it as a ceremonial space to help heal our native peoples, but we also open it up for other communities. Um, we had Sukkot out there for the Jewish community. Uh, all summer long, we, we were using different, we were letting different social justice organizations use the garden to meet uh, safely outdoors and to create art. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, um, and I'm just going to talk about this um, picture really quickly. This is a picture from Schiller Woods from our program in the fall. Um, and just to sort of explain what the day is like um, during our program, the kids show up in the morning, they get about four or five hours of time. In th and with COVID, we had them in three separate pods that would rotate to different sites in Schiller Woods. Um, when we set up our permit with forest preserves, we we specifically requested a place that didn't have active um, restoration work happening. Um, with you know, we didn't want to tread on the work that the really wonderful work that people are doing in um, conservation in other sites. Um, we feel like we would be able to um share like share those locations but just for our program we we you know we wanted to sort of test it out in a site that um wasn't actively undergoing any restoration work so um since Schiller Woods is so close to O'Hare um not a lot had been done because there um there isn't a lot of fire management happening there so um anyhow um and we can answer questions about the, the like specifics of the program in the chat. Um, happy to do that or talk after the talk. But um, just wanted to ask some questions, which um, I can't see as the person who's presenting the slideshow, but um, feel free to type in the chat what um, brings you to this talk. And um, some of the, since we work with kids, we always wanna know what, um, sort of experiences you had as a kid that got nature and dirt and bugs and trees and and uh, rain and wind into your heart and made you want to be outside because I know a lot of the people here are uh, people who cho you know chose to do this work through as a either a vocation or as a passion. So um, just curious what things pe brought people here all the way from the very early days. And then if you did something really fun recently outside, love to hear what it was. I can help facilitate and I can share something while we wait for some responses to come in. Yeah, um, yeah I got into this just um, as a way, I wanted to help, you know, like have a positive impact on the world. And I thought I could do that through um, learning about ecological restoration and getting outside. And something very fun I did recently was um, in like the almost three feet of snow or whatever that we have right now, um, I went out to a local prairie to see if I could find um, small mammal tracks on the surface of the snow. Because I've been learning about small mammals recently from um, one of my friends, Rebecca, who's also a ecological restoration volunteer. And um, we wanted to see if there were small mammals coming up from the ground level of the prairie up through all that snow um, to see if they were looking for seeds and stuff up there. So um, that was a fun thing that I did recently. Um, and Phil and Danny, I don't know if you want to read from that now. Yes. Um, so I guess uh, when one of us is talking, the other two can, can go back to the chat. I think it's going to be you, Jenny, right? Because Kathleen cannot see it. So you want yeah, to I'm in the chat. Read? Slide, Kathleen? Oh, I should go to the next slide. Yes. <laughs> okay, um, we're gonna play a couple of videos and, and yeah. ask you guys to think about what you're seeing here. This is completely 
one of the kids had wandered, the one in the uh, one had wandered too far away, and the other kids uh, were requested to call him back. And instead of going, they started howling at him, and it was fantastic. Like, most of the best things we, we don't we don't catch them in the in the video because they just they happen. So it is rare that we get these really cool videos, but these things happen all the time. You wanna go to the next slide, Kathleen? Um so we're gonna uh, first start defining what 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 play what this 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 thing that that uh, play is like let's go to the next uh, slide. So it has it has to come from inside, right? It's, it has to be like um, intrinsically motivated, and then uh, like people have to want to to do it. It cannot be coaxed or anything, and and it involves our attention to be there. Uh, sounds like a pack of potatoes. And and through these explorations, we um, we discover the 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 edges of what is uh, of where we are, our, our reality. You want to go to the next one, Kathleen? So here we see a cycle how the play usually, um, the way we perceive it, the way we, we, we dissect play is that we start first in the play drive, which is when is that um, this um, desire that we have, and it's, it can be it can be conscious or unconscious about about just thinking about it. And then the play cue is when a kid goes to the other, like just goes to that one and says, hey, hey, <laughs> or, or, or throws a stick to somebody or, or throws some snow or, or wears the same pants as the other person. And then the play return is when the other person says, hey, or do you want to play? Yes, I do. And then it's the kids start working on a frame. Like, okay, so you're gonna be, um, let's let's pretend that we're in a house or let's pretend that we are um, in, a, in a particular situation and the kids start building their space or their social environment. And then it becomes the flow of the game where they can spend hours or days or, or weeks working in the same, in the same uh, world. And eventually there's annihilation because all the games come to an end, either because the people get hungry or the moms show up to pick up or 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 um, for whatever reason, games is end. And then again the play drive starts again. Um, so the, the 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 thing about play is that it kind of eludes definition because it's precisely this change like it is it's not what is happening during the flow or it's not exactly what is happening in the in the um in the frame but through this exploration over and over the kids are learning about the environment that they're occupying socially and physically they're, they're pushing against the boundary boundaries of what is known through taking um low stakes risks they're just um taking a little risk and then doing it kathleen you want to switch it to the other one so yeah, playing is this is a this is an ex, a, a example of like imagine that the known is the is the color part and the unknown is the black part in 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 our minds. So like playing is like going beyond and discovering what we know. Like that's like science and and um, information that we're sharing one with another. Uh, just just exploring the pushing the boundaries of what is possible. Uh, one example of, of a boundary could be um, one, like a physical boundary that the kids can explore is like wanting to climb really high up and then and then they discover that their bodies cannot do it or jumping from one rock to another one and taking a risk is deciding to take the risk or a social risk can be um, engaging with another child or, 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 or taking something from another child. It's like all these things that they don't know what's going to happen. So that's play, like putting the little dots like it's in growing our own understanding this, the colorful part about, about life. Um, you want to get to the next one, Kathleen? This is, wait, what? Oh, oh sorry, okay. sorry. it just reset. <laughs> okay. Sorry. This one? So, uh, oh, no, it, sorry. Um, I'm, before we put play, so it's like, um, so playing is is I wrote over. Um, so this is the the 
the is, is a place the collaboration between the children and their caregivers is more like it's kind of like creating a society and, and as a as a group we are beginning to understand our our reality our our the place we inhabit and in by taking by by acknowledging that kids are part of the society and engaging with them uh we are reshaping how we as a society engage with one another um but this but playing applies to any age and the way we recognize that we are and whatever we act bec uh, becomes part of the the the, the, the norm um you uh so in this video there's a there's Let's play it and then I'll explain a little bit what, what we see. Here. So in this video, there were three boys who had already had a frame in which they were working together. They had the Grasshoppers band and they were making a lot of music. <laughs> And uh, there was one boy who was outside of the group, and then he engaged them by going bah! <laughs> their faces, and then the the response was was like nope. So like that part of like trying to to uh, enter a game or or taking a, a <laughs> um, coming in coming into a game is like taking a risk for the boy in blue, but it's also engaging into a into a flow like trying to engage a group that is already playing comes back into into working in the play frame once more so um by engaging one new person into the game into the flow you change the frame one more time um so it's like it can be the the risks that the kids are are, are taking are are physical and emotional and um social and that's okay because it's very low stakes um so like um, some some other other types of risk, the social risks that they take is like stealing from each other or hiding from each other or even lying from each other with each other. They seem to re, um, practice the social norms that they have in which they find them kind of uh, attractive or even taboo, which they cannot do in front of other people. Like they, they practice again when they are just surrounded by kids, when they are in, in, in very small environments, uh, and not so small environments, in environments where they feel comfortable and free. Um, so should we change to the next one, Mm-hmm. Thank you. Oh, wait. Let me just watch this again, though. OK. So preference is recognition. This idea that, that when we uh, Going back again to the frames that we have is that uh, uh, when the kids hear their their um, their society talking about a particular object or behavior in a in a specific way, they will rework and rework and rework that frame until it's is is part of themselves. Um, and it's so funny how much politics we see working in in kids' games. Like at some point. Um, during the not this election cycle, but the one before, there were all these kids just like chasing Nazis with sticks. And then uh, uh, there was uh, people who ran for mayor of town and the, the major, like they had an election and they voted and it was all self, um, um, self organized. And, and it's just fantastic to see how the kids are reworking really over and over what they hear the adults say, the, the, uh, allowed th the, the things that the kids are allowed to say and to think, and also the things that they are that they're not very polite, but they say them because they're thinking about them. So it's really fascinating to see it. Um, so in the case of preference recognition, like if if um, the 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 games they play for uh, the next slide is you want to put it at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And our motto for our park is, and when there's red in life, there's always a color because of all the pink the colors. Did you color them? Yeah. I colored this one and this one. And she colored that one. Yeah. Did you also make the hug? 
very much like uh, playgrounds and they built themselves a playground because they were there to play and 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 um, other games that the kids play and they're like some this is a fantastic game and the girls like um, the kids play games that are are uh, collaborative or also sometimes games that are competitive um, and it depends on how the kids are feeling on that day uh, but some games are are first they're surprising for the grown-ups but then when we analyze them better, they're actually fantastic games. Like when they were playing in, there was this one day, they were playing in the snow about uh, capturing each other. And then uh, they would capture other kids and have them work on the, on the the um, in the pond. Uh, and they were forced to work on polishing ice. So it was like a, a, a game of catching and outrunning each other, but also crafting. And everybody was okay working on those things and um or like pushing big boulders of snow uh, uphill and, and it does remind me of of thinking about sisyphus smiling because the kids were exhausted and also pushing snowballs uphill in a sliding um sledding in a sled so it was, it was really fantastic um can we go to the next one Kathleen? Yeah. Sorry. So the play workers' role will be is um, to to support people in each one of the stages of the of the of the play to help kids to help people uh, recognize when they have the, the impulse to play and then how to send the right cue because some kids can can go to other kids and say hey you want to play but other kids might come with a little piece of tissue and they start poking the other kids. Because they want to play to be catched or to be, um, but it, not, it might not be very well um, perceived by other people. Like I, I heard about some um, some child who, when he wanted to play, he would pick up sand and throw it at somebody else's face, and of course the response was not very good. So, like to help kids with vocabulary in in one stage and then the next stage to reply back, and then when they can collaborate to make a, a frame together, and then in the flow they can they can do their own. Um, the support of the play, work, the play worker is just to support those areas. Um, so um, the way we do it, thank you, Catherine, is through through tools and and active um, and helping the kids re um, analyze what is happening to them and what is happening in the situation. The, the, um, to help them create, uh, understand the, the meaning of what they're doing and help us understanding. And then we also need to know the context of each one of the children so it's a very um, personalized uh, um, situation and, and it's very nice um, and again this applies at any age and i would invite you to everybody in the chat to to think that if somebody, if we are being play work right now like uh because um who is our play worker like who is helping us or what is helping us to be in this in this flow what is what part of society is helping us if anybody wants to go to the chat um one of the things that play workers do is that we have to observe and understand before intervening um that's very important do you want to go to the next one please mm -hmm. so now we go to the name of the of the the, the title of the conference the um Skeleton hairdresser. You can see in the right side is this uh, this person. He it was his first day in the forest, and um, there was at some point there was a hair salon. You can see that he was using the the uh, a jaw that he found in the woods to get a nice uh, hairstyle. But it was happening with other kids. And, and think about the walnut worshiping is on the left. This game lasted for maybe three or four weeks. And it started because Kathleen, the, the, the kids were looking for walnuts. There were a lot this year. And Kathleen said, um, why, are you, why are you picking up so many? One of the kids said, we're looking for the for a perfect walnut. And Kathleen just did the play worker thing, which she did a little bit of pushing over. 
There's no such thing as a perfect walnut. Or I just thoughtlessly said that, but yeah. <laughs> and then the kids found the most perfect walnut and they started just adoring the walnut. And then the game turned into creating the acornation, the walnut shrines, and the kids will uh, keep on working on the same, um, building up the same social structure for for weeks and it was fantastic it was it was really really fun um the six stitches <laughs> it was um there was a case we had a we had a situation with uh, somebody who needed stitches and he was very calm um and uh, of course he was very scary to see all the blood coming up but uh by talking by showing him our scars and telling him stories about how we also got like injuries we had when we were kids, you know, when you show scars. Uh, he he was very calm and his mom texted later at the from the doctor's office saying that he wanted to come back, that he wanted to just the doctor to be finished stitching his uh, his finger so that he could come back on the same day. He did come next next week. It was it was really nice. And the endless mud pits, you know, spring. That's what it means. Um, so um, so yeah interspecies uh, um, interspe interspecies play is when so we're, when we're doing this call and response you remember the 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 um, having the drive and also calling to game to play the the response can be um, just anything like we're building the vocabulary between different species and by having this amazing opportunity of working in a in a living environment like like an ecosystem a living ecosystem we get to see that we get to see ourselves as part of the um it's not just a background it's a it's a living organism and it's it's fantastic it looks really nice it's not the same as working on minecraft where the kids get to work together and it's it's game the kids like to build things but the, but in minecraft there's a background in in reality there's a living organism supporting or existing and, and the kids can see themselves as part of it um so i want uh, i want us to imagine together what will um what will uh consensual interspecies play might look like and i i i, I wish we could we could write it down in the in the chat um if I, I imagine that, like for example, having a having a lover who has who with whom you have really good non-verbal communication, and you just kind of know what is happening. And, and uh, so, yeah, playing is the building up of this collective intelligence as a society where we're passing on to others how to how to move our bodies or how to exist in our in our space. Thank you. Um, so now it goes to Jamie. Thank you very much. Jenny, you go. You're, you're muted. You're still muted. Clock is ticking. <laughs> I'm kidding. Jenny, when you get a chance to unmute, um, you Jenny, can. you might have to. Um, you might have to. Uh, refresh your screen or um, possibly stop using your headphones. <laughs> Janie, once you can talk, I'm going to... Um, oh, Janie's gone. Are you, oh, Janie, you're here? Janie will come back in a minute. She'll okay, be back. I'm just going to talk through my um, a couple can of I, my slides. Um, can, I, can I put in a commercial? <laughs> you want to do your commercial? I have okay. a commercial. But okay. wait, there's more. Like, well, well, Janie comes back. Oh, Janie's here. So they're not coming okay. right now. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yep. I had to take my headphones out. Okay. So like so I was saying, play can change education. Um, children always took charge of their own learning, self-directed activities without adult and post uh, curriculum is children's natural ability to educate themselves. Uh, we talked a lot about changing vocabulary. Um, there's a lot of forts. Uh, and I know that's a problem in the forest preserve, uh, but we were thinking like, if there's so many people playing in the forest preserve, then the problem isn't the forts, the problem is actually there's not enough space, there's not enough open green space to play. So uh, so we were changing actually the idea of forts 
because it involved war, um, uh, like colonial undertones, and we started calling them homes. So on the right, that's the fort, and they were playing war and fighting with each other. And then on the left is when we changed the vocabulary and called it a home. They started making food for each other. They started opening restaurants. Um, they stopped. They stopped building a fort for each kid and starting to use the forts to share with each other. So the first week there was probably six forts. By the last week there was maybe, there was one big fort that everybody shared, a playground, a restaurant, and there was all these different um, levels of playing and like expanding on what they knew. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of children are not given the freedom to play uh, in our society, especially Black, Indigenous, um, children of color do not have um, access to play, and it's actually a dangerous environment if they go out and play. As we see, even in places that are um, for children to play, like the park, we know Tamir Rice, uh, he was just playing and he got killed by the police for it. So those are actual barriers that we have to think about when we're inviting kids to play. We don't see a lot of black and brown children in these places. Um, and that's one of the those levels is how do we make those parents feel comfortable to let their children come out and have the freedom that they deserve? Because all, all children need freedom. They need safe environments to play and explore. They need free access to the tools and ideas that and playmates that can help them on their path. Um, and anything that interferes with the freedom to play has to be addressed. So like from the broken glass on the ground to like colonization, white supremacy, discrimination and abuse. And with free play children are, if they're allowed free play, they're able to overcome fears, solve their own problems, acquire the physical and mental, mental skills to, to prepare themselves for the society they're in. And they actually create a culture around um, this idea of being in nature and like not only interacting with it, but actually being a part of it and seeing themselves as a part of it. When we change the vocabulary to talk about homes, then we started thinking about other people's homes and realizing that this is a home, this is all of our homes. Um, you can go to the next slide. And like, that's the idea that, there's this idea that the city of Chicago isn't part of nature anymore. And it's actually the opposite. Like this is nature, this is what we've done. And instead of removing ourselves, putting forest preserves and open green spaces as nature, thinking about all of this as nature itself um, will change the way that people are interacting with these spaces. So we would see more green spaces in Chicago if we stopped separating that this is nature and this is not nature. Um, like anywhere people aren't is nature is kind of the, the um, it's like the conservation industry movement, I guess, is damaging to indigenous people. And like some people think it's as damaging as the extractive industries. Um, the control of the forest reserve city planning is reaffirming that idea that people are not natural and they're unnatural outside of nature. You know, they, they exist where we're not. So um, building up this, this, uh, this relationship between kids, land, um, plants, animals, uh, it's, and doing that through play is a way that we, we notice at least in our communities, in our culture, my culture, um, play is central to uh, children learning to educate themselves. And free play is the center of that idea of like children need to play. They need, they don't need people watching them all the time. They can watch themselves, they can educate themselves. And we need to um, remember those connections between them. Uh, these are some pictures of the garden. Um, both of them are playing um, on the left. It's, uh, we were maple tapping two years ago that's us telling stories, telling jokes, uh, playing in the TV. It was pretty cold, so we had to stay in the fire. And on the right is the opening day. Um, the kids decided to play Red Rover. And it wasn't just the kids. You can see there's like some, they're young people, but they're adults. And that's also part of this intergenerational learning is it's kids have their own time to play by themselves, but there is still room for us to come in and, and play. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Passing on. Okay. Um, 
so I wanted to talk about the connection that I have with, um, with my work. I am deeply grateful to the Sone Woods community um, for being my mentors in conservation. And I've gotten to participate in a lot of really wonderful restoration and conservation activities. And in the process, I recall, um, oh, and this picture in the, this big picture on the left is of the first time I ever did um, insect. Uh, we, I, I don't know if anyone saw Trevor's present, wonderful presentation, but the, this is several years ago, the first time I ever did bug lighting, which was not part of that, um, part of the um, Chicago work that I did, but um, that was kind of something that, that, that spurred me on and motivated me to continue participating in environmental work um, is all the opportunities I've had to play and to gather and meet with people in these natural areas who are um, in a heartfelt and I think a very high and organized form of play, even if some people are getting paid to do it. Um, I think, as I said in the beginning, I don't think most of us would um, be here attending this virtual conference if we didn't um, deeply want to and have a love um, for nature that that united us all. So, um, and I think to Janie's point, an unfortunate aspect of this is that sometimes we end up excluding people who aren't doing these things because we don't see those the other people's forms of play as um, valuable to um, conservation of natural resources or natural areas. So um, I wanted to give a shout out to um, the urban farm community, the urban ag community, because I feel like it's um, one place where intergenerational play relationships can really shine because um, families are part of urban farms. Um, but also um, it's, another example of how play cues are everywhere and they can come from nature, even if this is something that might horrify people <laughs> uh, to see cattail seeds just going everywhere. Um, the cattail itself is a playful being and sort of invites this activity. Um, and so play cues can come from plants and they can come from the sky in the form of rain or snow um, part of our landscape, like Michigan, um, the rivers um, that many people recreate on, or even left by the roadside. And I was going to share a video of this guy who was like, he goes out to um, he goes out to this like degraded right of way area that where there's like tons of fly dumping and tires and stuff, and he was like flipping tires and like having so much fun like stacking them, but. Then I had this thought, I was like, oh man, I don't like, don't want, <laughs> like, I don't want to like do something harmful by, um, you know, sharing this activity. And then maybe someone's like, oh, I know where that is. <laughs> like, I just totally transparent. I had that thought. So that's a problem that we have is that there's policing that happens of play. Um, activities that maybe aren't necessarily um, actually harmful and include some of the things that that we might do because i mean that looks really fun i don't want to pay for a crossfit gym membership i should just go flip some tires <laughs> um like i would i would enjoy doing things like that so um i think people might here might share that sentiment but anyhow um we only have a few minutes left but the last thing i wanted to to spark is a discussion of um if people had ideas or thoughts about how um, play-based education or um, informal play spaces can actually interact with conservation work because I, I do think it is possible. Um, this is a list, we presented some of the stuff in, our, in a previous um, presentation, but I wanted to bring it back because I think the chat function is really useful for this. Um, to kind of share and discuss what do people think, like, can you imagine incorporating trampling or, um, you know, it, inadvertent seed dispersal or 
leaf jumping? Can you incorporate these things into the into the work that you do? And do you do it already? I'm sure some people do. I can't see the chat. Um, but yeah, yeah. I'll probably wait for um, some of those thoughts to come in. Um, I did jot down a couple of questions that maybe you can answer. Um, so question, Katie. Before, oh, go ahead, yeah. I have a commercial to make because our program started as a as like I. As you can tell by my accent, I'm not from here. I'm not from this weather. And and when my kids went to kindergarten is when I got my education about about how much I like being nature and I learned how to dress. So, <laughs> what is it? But wait, there's more. So we we um, we want to help out with the forest school for Illinois. We we're not the same, but we want to help out with their cost. So uh, we are coming up with this idea of having a. a a raffle. If in the next, <laughs> if in the next two hours, everybody who donates any amount of money to this uh, GoFundMe, um, we're gonna enter into a raffle for a scholarship for our program, and you can choose if it's gonna be spring, summer, or fall. Uh, just go into the into the GoFundMe and do any amount. We're gonna take all the names and then um, put those names in a raffle in the next one hour. So at five forty-five. We're gonna be finished with. Uh, we're gonna do the raffle. That's it. That's my commercial. So now the questions, Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Sol. I'm sorry I confused you with the four schools for Illinois. Yeah, <laughs> no, like no, no, no. overlaps. Um, yeah, that was my bad. I introduced you that way. Um, so someone asked a little bit ago: um, Is the purpose for the children to play outside and learn to play, or do you include how children should also recognize the importance of nature? Do they have directed play investigating the nature around them? Very little. So we we do when it, when uh, the the investigator like usually the, the 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 curiosity is individual. So the play worker comes and and, and talks. is is very it's very verbal. We talk and we notice what is happening. And if other kids join, we all work together. But in general, kids just assume that they can go and play at their own pace in their own in in their own games, and they can prepare for that. So we do we do talk to the kids um, as the as the environment invites us to do it. Like we realized very early on that bringing a curriculum was just going to be painful for the kids to be sitting listening to an, a grown up telling giving them a, a, a lecture while well, there was so much stuff going on the fear the rain the shadows the moths the mosquitoes the pond the, like it, it would be excruciating. So. We, we we bring what, the little bit that we know and we provide it to the kids when it's necessary, but not before. Mm -hmm. This is sort of a follow-up question that I just noticed in the chat. Um, so I'm a little bit out of order, but um, someone's wondering what would you do, at, like in response, what would you do if you saw kids playing in a way that you felt was destructive, like peeling bark off of live trees? Um, we um, don't, oh, go ahead, Jamie. Oh, I, um, we have like group agreements at the beginning of the day that we're not going to harm each other or um, harm the living beings around us. So that includes trees, animals. So if that happens, then usually the kids correct them and we never really have to step in. But um, if we do see destructive behavior, then we do step in and try to redirect them and maybe even have a conversation about why that's destructive or... We, yeah. We also, we kind of have like, Janie was saying a group ethos that's like built um, with the play workers um, and the play workers have different skill sets. So um, we, we educate and inform each other about these things too. But also there's some things like kids do need some like destruction therapy <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so we'll, direct, we'll direct people to like, you know, small, not habitat, non-habitat, standing dead, like buckthorn and stuff, if they really want to wail on something or fall in logs. Um, but again, the places that we're doing this are not generally high quality habitat, but that'd be an interesting conversation to have, like how to manage for that kind of just intrinsic, like desire to break things up with your hands. Yeah. Um, and yeah. just lastly, the, the, uh, the, Imaginary destruction kid to kid doesn't happen very often, but when it does, what we do is we separate the child who is uh, a part, like who cannot play, and we have several tools for that. We take the child for a walk, 
and we talk about it. Like we separate the child from the group and we go to the bathroom. So there's usually, it's usually involvement with water. They are holding it, they're holding it in and they get a little bit of ups, um, uh, frantic or they might be thirsty or hungry or there might be something else going on around their family. We, uh, we help them with their bodies. And then if we, when they come back, they cannot play, we just give them a job. And usually jobs do really well. And when the kids find out that they can play again, they leave their jobs and they go and, and join the, the game. And the jobs can be like bring it, helping us bring something heavy or, or they usually have to do with, with, with the body. Kids. Yeah, that's great. Um, another question that I saw that I think was more directed at Janie, um, should we not have forest preserves? And is it because they draw a boundary between people and nature? If you want to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, things like national parks, uh, ecological research, like um, those places kind of, you know, separate people from nature. And it's, that's the idea that's destructive, that we need these places preserved for something. And a lot of that is associated with the forced displacement of indigenous peoples, like the erasure of our identities, our history, our culture. A lot of those preserves were created um, as a dispossession tool for indigenous people. So um, the idea that only some places are special and need need like love or restoration when really everywhere needs. If we look around outside our windows, we're not gonna see a natural place. We're gonna see something that's on top of a natural place. Like we're gonna see buildings and we should be able to look out and see what is like, what makes us people and what makes us part of the world and not just people are over here and nature is over here, that we're all, we're all here together. Great. I don't know if there's any more questions that um, people want to ask in the chat. I think Soul has kind of been keeping up. And you too, Janie. Um. Um, I don't think we have any other slides. I just want to say thank you um, to the Forest Preserves of Cook County um, and to Forest Schools for Illinois and the Forest Play School. Um, Sean Schaefer, Liza Fischel, um, and many other people who have um, sort of helped Fraternal Forest find their way. Um, and also to Janie, um, who is, who joined us this year, um, and is going to be running the programs starting in the springtime. Great. Thank you all. Um, Kathleen, I don't know if you want to take a second to stop sharing your screen and take a look at the chat. It's up to you. Um, sure. I'm trying to do that. <laughs> but thank you all. That was a really terrific presentation. Um, One more thing. Yeah, if anybody wants to donate anything, I'm going to put the GoFundMe for mm -hmm. Forest School for Illinois. All the money there is going to get a, a lobbyist to help legalize schools for uh, kindergartners, which right now are illegal. But in my own personal experience, which is the only access that I have information in, in life, uh, it educated me a lot. Like I, I didn't grow up in this ecosystem and I, and I, and I love it. Like the snow and all these things that I couldn't understand. Um, and it's thanks to, to the education that my whole family received from, from, from them. So uh, help them so that they can be legal and help more families of, of transplants like me. I can imagine almost everybody from different ecosystems not understanding winter. Um, so yeah, uh, give the money and then go into the raffle. And if you, if you don't have a child who's in the edge of the forest, you can send a friend. <laughs>